Hi, this is Lance Winkel, and I'm here to present for you troubleshooting and cleanup techniques for 3D printing at Seagraph 2020. We got a lot to cover today, so let's get started. Uh, there is a QR code that is here. If you have a chance and you want to get look at any of the documents that I've provided for this, uh, that tiny URL or the QR code will take you there. Uh, we got a lot to cover. Uh, as I said, uh, my name is Lance Winkel. I'm a Form Labs ambassador. And I also teach at the Otis College of Art and Design. And for the last 12 years, I've run the Viterbi School of Engineering's 3D computer graphics and modeling minor, as well as 3D animation minor. I've also taught for the USC Roski School of Art and Design, as well as other schools throughout the LA and Orange County areas. Uh, I've got a lot of background in 3D printing, 3D design, 3D animation, uh, but let's get right to what we're here today to learn about 3D printing and how to make your 3D printing work better. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to dive into 3D topology. Your topology is what's happening inside the mesh and you can be an amazing artist, but ultimately you still need to get what's happening inside that data structure to be working for you. So what 3D printers need are three really, really simple but vital things. They need clearly defined geometries of adequate thickness with clear distinctions between solid and non-solid forms. Put simply, we need clean geometry. We need that thickness, unlike in the computer where it can be infinitely thin, impossible shapes, we have to make our material in the real world out of material that's gonna be strong enough to support it. That means molecules binding to other molecules. So we have to have them of adequate thickness to support that. But the computer also needs to tell the printer where do I print material? Where do I not print material? And that's why it needs to have that clear distinction uh, between solid and non-solid forms. Now, I came up with a couple of charts to help us out here. Um, on the left, you can see a bunch of hollow shapes. The topologies like what you see in those hollow shapes are problematic and most likely non-printable. Some of them might be on their own printable, but put into the larger spectrum of how they're interrelated, they can become problematic. The topologies like you see on the right side are examples that are 3D printable. So what's the difference? Okay, the biggest difference is that you can see the ones on the left side, there are hollow shapes that don't have thickness. They may have little surface gaps, so they're not airtight. They also may be overlapping and by themselves might be okay, but when you have an overlap, that's a place where sometimes the computer can get confused and say, wait, how do I print twice? Or why am I getting a signal that's saying print here, but also don't print here? So you can also end up getting weird fills and other problems that, that ruin your print, okay? What we need is an airtight model with no gaps, not even zero surface area gaps. And that's a big issue because if we take two vertices and move them so that there is zero distance apart mathematically, there's still a problem, even though we, by our eye, can no longer see that problem. Okay. There cannot be any overlaps and completely two manifold. We are going to learn what manifold, what we call two manifold versus non manifold is in a future set of slides here. Um, so these are some examples of airtight with no gaps versus airtight. You can see the solid blue on the right side. Okay. That little area there, imagine if that gets to zero distance would be a great example of a zero distance problem. No overlaps and also completely two manifold. Like I said, we'll be talking about that soon. Okay. <clears throat> game assets, visual effects assets. Let's say you're coming from a video game or let's say you're coming from uh, working on a production and you wanna start taking assets that you've worked on a larger production and you wanna make them 3D print either for product development, uh, maybe for a big trade show that's coming up. One of the big problems is, is those assets that look so great in the video game and are optimized for the video game or those assets that are so great for a visual effects sequence oftentimes are not really suited for what a 3D printer needs. Some examples, okay. Oftentimes game assets may have stripped down geometry. They may not have any back faces because your camera never sees them and they can 
reduce the amount of geometry in the game, increase the speed of the game and the performance of the game by removing those areas. Uh, they may also have overlapping geometries. Some video games might use multiple collision meshes. And in those type of cases, you might have a bullet collision mesh or a player to player collision mesh or even a player to vehicle or a vehicle to world mesh. And with all of those meshes, you may only see the outer skin of what is renderable, kind of the hero mesh. They might even have different level of detail meshes. So they might have a high res one that's up close and a low res one that's far away. Well, that different resolution meshes, all those collision meshes are superimposed and overlapping. Well, the problem is if you just take that character and try to 3D print it, it's gonna to try to print all of those meshes and you end up having a problem. So what we wanna do in those type of cases is edit those meshes out adjust and work with them, fine tune them. So we get just the mesh we wanted with just the right set of criteria to it so that you get that hero mesh that looks really nice. You can actually then get it all the way to, to print and to market, but getting rid of all of those other meshes that are, that are useful in game, not useful to the 3D print. Cinematics have the same problem. Oftentimes we like to build our sets from a series of, if you're doing, let's say, um, photo collage or photo montage from a set, you might have a, a 3D set, a virtual 3D set that's all built out of little, little planes with texture maps on them. And it looks great in camera, works great for your shot, but it's infinitely thin planes that the 3D printer can't print. Same thing happens a lot of times with particle systems where you might have visual effects that are sprite based and a sprite is just a square, two triangles with their normals facing towards the camera. And because they're facing towards the camera, um, we don't see them from the side but they're still infinitely thin little triangles, not the lovely explosion or smoke or particles that you might want. Okay. So oftentimes we have to go through and take some of these behaviors out of our system and make some amendments so that it's 3D printable. The last big one is if you're dealing with animation. Oftentimes, uh, cinematics and animation, we have a rigged character and there's elaborate deformers like muscle deformers or, or even just uh, simple skeletal deformers or nonlinear deformers. And the problem with that is when you create a bind pose to a skin, oftentimes it's keeping a record of the T-pose skin at the same time, it's keeping a record of the deformed skin. So you have to delete that history, delete those deformations while still keeping the pose that you wanted so that you can now get that model and not have a T-pose version of that model somehow superimposed when it gets to the 3D printer. Okay, same thing with muscle systems. You want to print the outside skin of your cool character from a fantasy film, not all the muscles and all the bones that allowed for it to deform in those shots. Okay. Again, we need clearly defined geometries of adequate thickness with clear distinctions between solid and non-solid forms. Those are the what we're looking for. Everything else is us trying to get that for the 3D printer, to help the 3D printer to do what we want it to do and what it ultimately wants to do for us. Okay. Um, some of you may not work in polygons and you've heard me using a lot of polygon terms. Some of you might come from CAD, you might come from uh, Rhino or another program that uses NURBS like Maya. And you might say, well, I'm, working in, I'm not working in polygons. I'm working in a CAD system. or I'm working in some other design software that polygons doesn't apply to me. An interesting thing to remember is polygons are what the computer renders. Our computer graphics cards just process triangle count and triangles of models. So even if you're working in CAD, you're looking at polygon models. They're just what's called tessellation is happening so that that beautiful round, super smooth model you're looking at can be processed so the computer can draw it for you. Same thing happens when we go to 3D print. You might have a beautiful CAD drawing, but no matter how meticulous that design is, it ultimately is getting reduced down to triangles when it goes to the 3D printer as a mesh. So we have to understand that everything ends up as a polygon. Okay, an example in the diagrams you can see here uh, on, the, on the left side, uh, column, number, or column number one, you can see two different NURBS patches, okay? Slightly different sophistications. Column number two, you can see the same 
object, but when it's gone through a tessellation algorithm. In this case, the automatic tessellation, which uses a concept called chord height ratios, which has been applied to it. Chord height ratios in simple, if you have a tighter turn of a curve, they put more triangles there. If you have less of a turn of a curve, less triangles. Now, it looks pretty good at the top there for like a, a generic model, but I could optimize it like you could see in that third column by just going in and customizing my, my tessellation qualities that goes inside in Maya. It's something called modify NURB, convert NURBs to polygons. Well, notice the bottom of number two. That is that same generic tessellation based on chord height ratio applied to a NURBS object that has a little bit more curves. Notice how it's got really convoluted triangles. It's okay, but if I want really nice smooth contours, I'm gonna need to put triangles there. If you've ever downloaded something from a site like a Thingiverse or another type of, of site and you've gotten a model that has hexagons for bolt holes or has a lot of stair steps that look very different from what was maybe supplied as a sample print model, oftentimes that's because when they uploaded that model to the site, they went with a, a standard low resolution export and took the defaults. And so what you're getting is a model that's very, very crude now. Okay. <clears throat> you also can notice a lot of times when you're looking in models, sometimes back faces don't draw at all, or like you can see in the lower right picture there, sometimes they render as like a solid black color. This is often a function that, that our graphics systems do to help us to understand a really simple bit of logic, which is this. All polygon surfaces are inherently one-sided. Not two-sided like a sheet of paper, but one-sided. They have a face that has a normal, and then there's nothing else on the other side, okay? This is what's called two-manifold, and a two-manifold surface has all of those faces all lined up to fit together. In a lot of our 3D programs, we have something called backface culling. All backface culling is, is it starts drawing those faces the way they're supposed to be drawn, only one-sided. When you have an object that has two-sided as an option for rendering, which is what's happening here in that picture with those black solid surfaces, that's actually those back faces, but instead of drawing them as nothing, as invisible, so we could see through the geometry, much like if you've ever gone outside of a game level, you can look through those back faces because they don't exist. You can see into the level from outside the map. Well, we should normally not see those, but Maya in that case of that drawing is helping us to see it, but then it draws it as that solid black shade so that we have a, an indication that that is not our surface, that is an anti-surface. Well, what you'd like ideally is to have all of those facings so they line up together. So all those gray surfaces are on one side, all the black surfaces are on the other, okay? This is what's referred to as two manifold. Now, two manifold is a concept that a lot of people who may have worked in 3D for years go, wait, wait, what is two manifold? Why am I hearing only about this now? It is a really, really vital concept it's what's essential for Booleans to do their process. And since a 3D printer is really just a whole bunch of fraction of a, of a millimeter thick Boolean slices, might be something important for us to study. Um, but a lot of people don't realize this. So there's two states, two manifold, which is again, when all of those normals line up on the same side. And then any other case where that isn't true is considered non-manifold, okay. Here's a good example of all the different types of cases where you can create a non-manifold condition. Notice I also listed, for Maya at least, several of the tools that can create non-manifold geometry. Edit Mesh Merge can create it, and that's one of them we use to sew up holes quite often. Extruding if you extrude an edge. Uh, Deleting faces can sometimes create a little bit of a, of a pivot point. Uh, on the left one, you can see we call that the T shape. And the reason why that's a problem is because either because you merge vertices or you just extruded just an edge, you end up having three faces, but you end up having three faces only sharing an edge. They don't have any thickness. So it's infinitely thin and can't be printed. It also, because it cannot say which one is the proper one, it counts as an invalid polygon. 
Okay. The two that kind of look like bow ties, this is because they share a vertex. And a lot of times if you delete faces, but you leave one of the vertices there, unless you separate out that vertex, it technically can spin. And mathematically it's spinning. It's, it can't say yes or no. And because it can't say yes or no, it becomes no, it becomes non-manifold. Okay. And it can happen with multiple cubes, it can happen with faces and planes. Uh, another one that happens quite often is just a flipped normal. Oftentimes if we're modeling something with two different objects, like I modeled a character, but then I model their head separately, I might have had their faces inverted because of me flipping and mirroring geometry or something. And then I just end up having one side is inverted. Um, that's an easy one to fix because you can just do it to the normals and reverse them. Um, but sometimes we just don't notice it. Okay. Another really weird one is at the end there, and it happens when people extrude, but they don't actually pull out the extrusion. They do the extrusion command, but they don't actually give it some thickness. And what that does is it creates faces that are zero surface area and zero distance. The problem with zero in computers, the problem with zero in math, is that you can't divide by it. So if anyone writes a script that involves distance, or the distance or surface area of an object to be calculated in the dividing column, the problem is you end up getting a divide by zero and that can create really big problems for some tools. So it also prevents things like split polygon from splitting across it because zero means that it can't actually see that face. It's zero. So when it splits across it, it can't. Okay. These are problems. Okay. Another one that happens is different Boolean algorithms and Boolean, if you're like me, you love using it until it doesn't work. It's like we love it till we don't. Problem with Boolean is that it's doing a very, very complex set of comparisons between models to determine what it should keep, what it should remove, where it should draw new split lines and where it should delete stuff. Now, for years, Maya had a a good Boolean algorithm, but it was very finicky. It needed absolutely two manifold geometry. However, uh, they updated that in 2015 to a new algorithm. That new algorithm was a lot more solid. Okay, and we can see what we were needing from before, right? We need those things on the blue side, on the right, to be Booleanable. Okay. That 2015 algorithm was really powerful, a lot more forgiving. Okay, but it had some problems. Okay, and you can get this by the way still by just going into the options box and checking use legacy algorithm will go to that 1998 algorithm. Okay, this is a project I was working on that has a really good example of this and you can see an example of what this actually was. It was two overlapped pieces of geometry. Okay, when I went to use that new 2015 algorithm and I, I went in and Booleaned it, at first I thought everything was good and then I noticed something and in that all solid image, you can kind of see it, right? You can kind of see that there's that, that, little, um, that little set of surfaces inside, okay? What happened is the Boolean did the operation but it, it forgot one part of its operation it forgot to delete the interfaces. And now you can see in that central lower left image, it created kind of a T-junction. It had a little bit of the capsules outside, it had the inside and it had another edge. Those are actually three edges connecting. Okay, now it's going around the surface, but that is still a problem. Okay, now it was easy enough once I saw it for me to go in and select those faces and hit delete. But often if you're, let's say not, as experienced, or if you're just not used to a new program, or you're getting used to a new algorithm, or if you just have a really complex set of, set of details in a scene, you might miss something like that. And then you wonder why your, pro your project is getting a whole bunch of errors. And it's because it's got this non-manifold hidden inside it. All those tan faces highlighted in that upper left image there, I couldn't see them. Okay. Another place, and I'm gonna kind of skip kind of quickly through these, but again, the slides are there if you want them, is that a lot of times we confuse combine and Boolean. Combine, something called mesh combine, is when you collapse a whole bunch of different mesh shells into a single mesh shape. And if you have two objects here and you do a Boolean or a mesh combine, it's gonna give you the same thing as doing a, a 
Boolean union. They're, they're separated. But when they're overlapped, that's where you get a problem because technically combined does not get rid of all that overlap. So you've got all that stuff inside here overlapped. What you want in a Boolean is to separate that out. So you've got the outer core, but all that internal guts has been removed. Okay. So it's important to realize mesh combine is not the same as Boolean union. Okay. Now, a lot of people will forget that though. And like this text, they'll get ready to go print it not realizing that those T, E, X, and T are separate, not actually connected to the mesh. Okay, now you can see that in the upper left there. Here's that same text, but notice how it has small little gap. Okay, gaps are dangerous. And a lot of people go, oh, well then I'll do Boolean, it'll solve it. Well, that gap, that won't get boolean So when I do a Boolean on this, I might think it's one mesh, but it's just like doing a mesh combine. It now is separated and it will have no supporting structure. So as they print, the T, the E, the X, and the T are gonna break off from the model and float around in my goo or cause a FDM bird nest to start, okay? On the far right, you can see the problem with zero. Zero is close. And a lot of times if you do Boolean, Zero is going to be fine. But I encourage my students, I encourage my colleagues, I encourage you, overlaps are your friend. So like you can see in the center, if you can force an overlap, then do a Boolean with it, it's going to have, it's giving the algorithm that much more attention. So it's easier for it to say, absolutely, this is a yes. Absolutely, this is a no. Okay, especially if you have, let's say, text on like rings or text on something that's going around a corner or some surface details, because there might be places where if it's zero, where it contacts and you'll get a Boolean connection, but there might be other places where it's got a little gap and you're not going to get the Boolean connection there. And so you're going to have these little air bubbles inside. Okay. So almost always I re recommend if you're getting ready to do like a Boolean operation, sink it just a little bit more into it, it'll make that much stronger of a connection because the Boolean math will have more of a clear cut case to make its decisions. Okay. Um, another thing that can become really problematic with Booleans, it's not as much with the newer tools, but especially with some of the old, um, a lot of times people get so quick and easy to do a Boolean that they don't pre-intersect their Boolean. So what's a pre-intersection? Okay, on the left, you could see there's those four little dot pegs that are going to cut through the green cube. And if you use the old algorithm, right in the center there, you can see this, this surface, but notice how it cut out those holes. That looks great. But notice how that tan colored face, the one I have selected there, it has an outer four edges to make the outer face, but then it has those three circles in it, but there's no edge connecting them. So technically this is an impossible surface because it is a surface that has a hole in it without a way of getting to the hole, split polygon, inserting edge loops, subdivisions cannot get across. There's only one way to solve that and that is with mesh triangulate. Now you can see mesh triangulate in that lower left cube and see the mess that it leaves. Now. I could now split that polygon, but I've got all those faces I now have to go delete, okay? On the far right, you can see a very, very smartly done one. What it is is the same geometry from the far left. I just pre-split across those rings on the green cube before I did the Boolean. Now those edges enable the, the Boolean to separate that piece into, I think there's what, nine different faces that form that top main face. One of them kind of looks like a little L shape. One of them kind of looks like an upside down T shape. One like looks like a cross in the center, okay? But each one of those faces can be split across because each one of them was pre-intersected. And I don't have to go through that process of trying to clean up that really messy stuff there. Okay. Same thing can happen with text and any types of subtle surface details. The text you see on the far left, if I don't pre-intersect the white cube with a line, is gonna create a nice little text effect in the back, but see how there's the square and the text don't connect? I'm gonna have to triangulate that face that has that embossment of the word text in it, and it's going to be so dense that it's probably gonna take me hours of mesh editing just to clear it up to get back to something simple. Or like you can see in the lower right, if I just put one split across that white face of that white cube, 
Then I do my pre, it's now pre-intersected. Now I do my Boolean. It's the same result of a Boolean, but without having to go through those hours of cleaning up that triangulated mess. So pre-intersect your Booleans. Okay. All of this leads back to a concept of convex versus concave shapes. Uh, some old video games used to require you to have convex faces on things um, so that it didn't have to do the splitting. Most of our modern programs can actually split concave faces and they do it automatically for us. The problem is oftentimes we get so elaborate in our models, we forget about the small minutia and Maya is automatically, any 3D program is automatically going through and doing these little, uh, these little adjustments, okay? So the four problematic pieces you see on the top and the right there are all because I had a convex shape on the left side and it's just what happens if it automatically chooses another edge to do the split. Meanwhile, if I do a single split to that original, notice how it becomes impossible to create a mess because it divides it up into two very simple quads. So we want to avoid concavity when possible. So ideally you go through on your model and you clean it up by adding some splits here or there so you get nice convex shapes. Okay. <clears throat> Now, that's a pretty good breakdown of the things most people encounter within the mesh that they can do right now to make it so that their meshes are gonna be that much cleaner for the 3D printing process. The next one we're gonna talk about, unfortunately, is that STL, the format for 3D printing, is very old. It was created in 1987, which is the same year that Predator came out. That's only five years after Tron was released in theaters, okay? It's 33 years old. It's a good format but it is a format with some age, okay? So why would this be a problem? It's a problem because STL was only built to support inches and millimeters. And the problem with that is a lot of our programs like Maya use centimeters as their default. And sometimes our exporters have trouble doing the math in between, okay? What this means is when we go to export, you always want to do a check before you send a product out because otherwise you might get a product that's instead of being 10 millimeters or 12 millimeters becomes 12 centimeters and that's going to be a massively more expensive product. Okay. Um, and you don't want to get something back two weeks later and have to tell a client that you screwed up and now they're going to have to pay even more because you screwed up on something. So when exporting to STL, you want to create what's called an index file. And I'll be talking about that over the next several slides. Um, but what you also want to do is do tests. Um, so options boxes are your friend. Okay. Like I said earlier, if you've ever downloaded a model from something like Thingiverse and you've gotten holes that look like octagons or hexagons, most of the time it's because they were exported out of the CAD program and they were exported with uh, the defaults. Now this is from a student that was making a GoPro style mount um, and they had a beautiful looking model satisfied all the criteria we needed, but they kept getting really lousy 3D prints back. And you can see what happened. They used the presets. And I asked them what presets or what settings did you use? And they said, there's a settings menu for exporting to STL. So we went and looked. Their settings were 30 degree angle tolerances, which is the course preset. That means you're only gonna get 12 subdivisions going around the hole, which meant she had to take a drill and constantly keep trying to to clean that chamber up. Also meant all of her outside edges looked angled as well. So that was a bit of a problem. Well, angle tolerances can be set from coarse to fine and fine brought it up to 10 degrees. And you can see it's a little better, okay? So we finally went through and just went custom and we went down to a two degree of angle tolerance. Now that added a whole lot more angles, but it meant that all of her outside edges now printed and looked as smooth as what they did in the computer, okay? Again, a lot of CAD programs, they have sliders and other things inside the options that allow for this. Maya has things for this uh, if you use the options box. But if you don't, you're only going to get whatever the software engineer has built in as their default. So I highly recommend going through using your options box, okay? Here's a different example 
similar idea, really nice looking model of a little like tank turret. Okay, but this beautiful model kept printing like something that looked like a cheap gemstone. It was all faceted. Well, the problem was, again, that surface continuity was not being satisfied with enough subdivisions. Okay, but they were also having trouble visualizing it in the computer. So some things that can happen, and I'm using some Maya terms for this, but in Maya, you have a concept called wireframe unshaded, which allows you to turn on the wireframe so you can see it visually on the model. Okay. Also, if it's a polygon, go through and go to mesh display hardened edges, because if you see the hardened edges in the 3D, you're going to feel it with your finger when it 3D prints, okay? If it's too faceted, then up the, up, up the subdivisions. Okay, some other important things along the way, deleting construction history, especially if you're dealing with, with things like rigged characters and things that use deformers. Uh, I have this all the time because my deformers mean that my model has a place with a T-posed character somewhere, but then also has the deformed and posed character. And sometimes that means I might get two meshes simultaneously exported into an STL because of that history link between them. So delete your construction history. You may also in some cases have to optimize the scene size depending on if you're using instances or other things like that. You want to be printing actual geometry objects, not instances or other things that might be virtual from advanced, you know, production techniques you might be using. You also want to freeze transforms, especially scale. Um, and you want to hollow out your model to some extent. Um, not only will it make it cheaper, it'll make it faster and less torque on your model. You also want to create what's called a log or an index. And that log is your X, Y, and Z dimensions in ideally millimeters so that your vendor can actually reach out and know this is what you intend without having to, you know, call you when it goes bad. Okay. Hollowness. Now, New Formlabs printers, Form 3, Form 3L, these new printers have a feature called low force stereolithography, which is a flexible lens, and it is changing a lot of this so that you don't have as much peel torque. But typically, and I'm talking from an SLA standpoint here, SLA has always had one critical area in its process, which is the peel, where you have to peel that object off of the lens. Um, LFS, changes that drastically, lowers that peel stress. So having hollow objects is not as critical to the peel as it used to be, but it's still going to give you faster times because that hollowness means less actual time burning in that laser. Uh, it also means less torque because you only have a smaller bit of surface area. Um, but hollowness is important and it if you need something to be solid later, you can always go do a casting for it later. You will save money, you will increase production time, um, and you will lower that ultimately that peel stress so that you have a better, cleaner model quicker. Okay. Making an index varies by program, but every program has an ability for you to test and see the size of what you're working with. So, in Maya, if you go and grab an object, go to its shape node of its mesh shape, and you go down to the bottom under something called this object display bounding box information. And if you go into that, it will show you the maximum and the minimum. Those maximum and minimums, you take the maximum, you subtract the minimum, and you will now have that bounding box information. Now you can see there with the Z, the Z bounding box is 16.261 max minus 31.575 minimum. You say, well, isn't that going to be somewhere like 15 millimeters? Notice how it's 47.836 millimeters. That's because basic remedial math here. When you take a number and you subtract a negative, subtracting a negative becomes addition, right? You're adding them together. That means that geometry crossed the origin. So you're having to add the negative distance to the positive distance to get the actual accurate assessment. So I will go and take all of this bits of data that I gather on each one of my parts and I will create an index. Now indexes can take a lot of form. Um, if it's a simple one or two models, I might just use Word or Notepad. 
or even just include it in an email. But if I'm dealing with a very large production, I may actually use something like Excel where I can have columns for things like quantity. I can have the X, Y, and Z bounding box information for each one of my products, the name of the file. Uh, I could even have different materials that might get used. So if I'm dealing with one that needs to be in a transparent material, another one needs to be in a tough material, I can actually, or if a vendor needs to print something in metal and do a completely different manufacturing method, I can actually put all that in my Excel file so that I now am handing off to my vendor everything they need to do the work cleanly without needing to ask me, okay? The big things here is I will almost always send them my basic data file in, in this case, the Maya binary for Maya. I will also send them like an FBX file. If I'm in CAD, it means I usually send them the, the native CAD file, but then I also send them like a step file. Uh, then I will send them the STL file, and then I'll also send them whatever that text document is that cross-references each part with its XYZ bounding boxes and any other materials. This becomes an index, okay? And the reason the index is so important is because print vendors do not know how big something should be or what it should be made out of unless you tell them. Size and scale are the easiest things for them to fix. They just need to know it, and they cannot read your mind, okay? So you create a file index that carries all of this for you. And that's gonna also be something really critical because it helps them to get their quote around sooner. If you have all this material and you do your due diligence up front, then they're gonna be able to give you an understanding clearer of what all those things are. If there is a problem, they're gonna be able to account for it much quicker, okay? It means less delays for the vendor to process, faster turnaround, and your quote can also much easier get more accurate to the actual cost, okay? Last thing here is probably the most important. If you're an educator or you're a manager, I encourage you, it's critical that you set the expectation for your staff or your students early on that this is something that's required for them to have a print. It's what's required for them to complete that task. Uh, I see a lot of students oftentimes that will complain about, well, I, did, I, did, I just got it there. And, I, and, then, and then they'll complain, well, they said it was two days and they said they couldn't print it because of this. I make it a part of their submission. I make their grade dependent on it. I just announce it ahead of time. I say, if you submit something without a, an index or some kind of documentation of these things that are really critical, it counts as zero. And my students then very quickly go, oh, this is kind of mission critical. I guess I need to step up to plate. And your, your staff will do the same, okay? Okay, so SLA printing. SLA printing is what we also call stereolithography. It's what Form Labs printers do. The Form 1s, the Form 2s, the Form 3s, okay? Um, photopolymerization. Um, there's more and more of these coming to the marketplace, um, but a lot of people, when they think of 3D printing, they immediately think of FDM printers, which are the hot glue gun plastic injection mold printers uh, or injector printers. Um, the reason why I wanna talk a little bit about this process is because SLA is an incredibly powerful tool set that's just misunderstood. Okay, and I've kind of broken down the steps that go into it here. The peel step, which is something that you're going to hear about quite a bit, is the critical, critical phase of SLA printing. Okay, okay. The peel step is what your thickness of each layer is. And what that is, is after it has lasered that, that material, it's still stuck to a transparent lens and has to be peeled off and then realigned so they can now have a little bit of liquid there so they can start the next layer, okay? So you print that layer, peel it up, bring it back down, print the next layer, bring it up, and slowly, slowly your model is grown, hanging, suspended from a platform. So, LFS, you'll start hearing a lot with respect to Formlabs printers. LFS is a, a low force method. It means they use a flexible lens instead of a rigid lens. And what that means is you're only contacting the model in a very small area rather than on the entire plate at once. It lowers the amount of peel torque um, and allows for some really exciting uh, updates to the SLA printing um, process, okay? The thing is, LFS is going to take a lot of what I talk about over the next several slides. It doesn't make that obsolete, but it does mean that we have a lot of this that used to be super critical is not as critical anymore because of LFS. 
So let's understand a little bit about what's going on with LFS. First, when you 3D print and your printer on an SLA printer, that platform goes down into the goo, you're gonna have a set of very, very long exposures where it's gonna be burning in for quite a little bit of time, building an anchor that, that connects that liquid to the plate, okay? That's your anchor, okay? Then over time, you're going to see these little supports and your supports have been pre-calculated in the software before the render even started or before the print even started. And you're going to start seeing the blue there starting to take shape and that's the model starting to take shape. Okay. Each one of the pieces of that model is connected to one of those support towers. If there's a part of the model that is not connected to one of those support towers, that is what's called an unsupported minima and that will catastrophically fail. Okay. So each subsequent layer starts to peel and eventually your shape takes place. And when it's all finally done, it extracts itself back up, hangs there and drips some of the remaining non-exposed material back into the tank. You then use isopropyl alcohol, not beer, IPA, isopropyl alcohol, uh, to rinse off the unexposed resin. Oftentimes you use a uh, 405 nanometer uh, light or a UV light, depending on the, on the print material, uh, to do what's called a post cure, which gets it to its optimal tensile strength. Um, I highly recommend using 99% IPA. It might cost a little bit more, but it lasts longer. And it just gives a much cleaner finish with a lot less having to scrub. Um, I also say, don't be a cheapskate. Replace your IPA when it gets gross. Um, you notice there it says in red, don't make napalm. If you leave IPA and exposed resin that's been diluted into it there long enough, it can re-gelatinize. It'll take time, but what that happens is, is you get a gelatinization of it, and it's like napalm. Napalm is a gelatinizing agent in gasoline. Well, great. So now you've created napalm out of IPA. Um, don't be a cheapskate. If you're not going to use your, your alcohol for a while, uh, throw it out. Um, if you're going, if you've been using it quite a bit and it seems like it's sticky all the time, it's probably gross. In that case, replace your IPA. Okay. So, um, also chemical waste services know how to deal with IPA they're probably gonna get a little weirded out by a weird flammable semi-solid gelatinized substance that once was IPA. Um, Cause how do they file that? So replace your IPA when it gets gross, okay? Um, I also say regardless of 3D printer, research your material specifications. Companies like Form Labs have every one of their print materials is not only known by their software, but they have full documentation on each one of those processes. If you're going to Shapeways, every one of the print materials that they can print out of from sterling silver to steel to high detail plastic, all of those things have information available for you. So use that information, okay? There is not a vendor and there is not a 3D printer manufacturer that wants to make a product that fails for you. They wanna be able to help you and get done. But the sad part is they're not psychic. They, they have to only work with what you give them, garbage in, garbage out. So they will help you if you start to ask, um, but make the ask. Okay. I gave you a couple of links here. And again, if you've downloaded this after the class is over, you can take a look at some of these links. Uh, Form Labs has a whole bunch of really useful uh, resources for their materials. Uh, Shapeways does as well. Uh, and like I said, every 3D printer vendor out there will have materials available for them. It's just a matter of doing a Google search and starting to get, uh, do the deep dive. You'll find stuff. Okay. Now these are dealing with staging a print for SLA. Um, like I said, LFS, that low force stereo lithography is changing a lot of how we work. So, uh, biggest thing that we want to really fight is to avoid what's called an embolism in, in SLA. An embolism is, kind of the opposite of what happens in, in a drinking water dispenser if you go to you know have one of those water coolers. At a water cooler, there's a certain point where you're pouring out water and you get that big glug of a bubble that goes to the, from bottom to top. In SLA, if you have a chamber that traps liquid in it, it's like a straw. It holds the liquid as it goes up and it creates this vacuum of all this resin. And the resin is, it's like a thick syrup. Okay, at some point the oxygen 
to liquid will equalize. And when it does equalize, there's gonna be this heavy amount of torque as that oxygen displaces and that liquid displaces back into your tank, okay? Uh, if for some reason you had a lot of liquid, you could fill the tank enough that it creates a tsunami where some of the liquid when you do a cleaning uh, uh, pass could actually now spill over the tank, but also it could start creating peel lines and other problems or even break your model off from, from the, the support. Okay, so how do you deal with this? You prevent embolisms by creating drainage holes. Now in these five examples you can see here, the one on the right side is the only one that was in its default state printable. And that's because it has a drainage hole at the bottom and it had a drainage hole at the top. So it was able to equalize over its entire length. Now each one of these other objects was hollow, but they did not have a drainage hole and the other drainage holes were so high up or in such awkward areas that they couldn't get rid of that material. So this is something where my student had to go back in and either with a sphere or a cylinder did another geometric boolean to create like a two millimeter hole. And what that did is allowed for the oxygen and liquid to evacuate over time as it printed and that prevented the embolism and allowed them to print just fine. Okay. <clears throat> Another one that happens on SLA is a lot of people want to, they're constantly trying to optimize, right? You want to keep, as, this is literally one of my very first 3D prints on a Formlabs printer. Okay. I wanted to save resin, so I made it as low as I could to the ground. And when I got it back, it had a weavy sidewall that looked really odd. Okay. And what I learned was that my want to be as efficient as possible wasn't enabling the printer to print as cleanly as possible. And what this really demonstrates is that SLA printers want to grow an object like a stalactite. They want to grow it from a point and have it expand out. But each time they have a peel, there's going to be a little bit of torque. So what I want to do is I want to limit that torque on the components. So deep down at a microscopic level, the problem is, as you can see at these little arrow points, these little bridges start to have to grow between the different layers. And those bridges are so sharp, but they're also very fragile and thin and they're moving around in a very thick resin. So much like when you have the, the egg material in like, a, in like an egg flour soup, right? And it's kind of contained within that thick broth, right? These little parts are floating around. They're still supported, but they're still very light compared to a heavy resin. Okay, so they have a tendency to break and they have a tendency to move around. And if they move around and have not come back to normal by the time the laser cures them, they start to get these weaves because they get cured and rebonded now with more laser light at a different line. And that's what was creating that little stair step. Okay. <clears throat> Another one, and you can see I've said a couple of times so far, I've talked about these things called unsupported minima. Well, it's time for us to really understand what these are. These are catastrophically dangerous things to your model. Most programs are going to start hunting for them, finding them, and, and highlight them in red to say, dude, you got to work on this. Okay, so what is an unsupported minima? An unsupported minima is a little piece of geometry that for some reason, the math program didn't find it to connect it with a little support structure. So when this print was being made, it had been all cleaned up, it was high resolution, but that vent that was on the back, that kind of air cooling vent, uh, it had all these little support structures that weren't connected. And that means they stayed glued and bonded to the lens while the rest of the print was getting peeled up. They never got peeled away. So what happens is every layer, it goes up and comes down, it stays on the ground and it keeps getting burned bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually you've got these very hard cysts on your lens that if they do pull away, usually pull away so hard that they damage other parts of your model they become stuck to, or they break away eventually and refloat around in that goo, eventually compromising another part of your print. Okay. Most of the tools are designed to find this, but unsupported minimas are really, really vital to find. And what you want to do in most programs is use the software to visualize that print process and look to see if you can find those unsupported minimas. And if your model says unsupported minima detected, you want to go in and you want to find it, hunt it out, or try reorienting the model to a different area where maybe it won't have an unsupported minima anymore, okay? This is what happens 
if you allow an unsupported minima, and by the way, this tank was less than, less than a day old. This was a brand new Form 1 uh, being used in one of my summer high school classes. And because a person wanted to make this really cool Iron Man looking kind of thing, uh, but he had had hollow shapes hidden inside the mesh that I didn't catch. This was a seven hour old printer. And by the time it was done catastrophically exploding, you can see it's got the, that material that was semi-exposed now floating in the resin and it's obstructing other parts of the material that are floating in the resin. And, and it's, so what started off nice and clean because of one part, it's like a little fragmentation that keeps expanding until eventually it ruins the print, may likely ruin future prints, this one not only ruined the ability for this tank, the tank now had damage, um, it also burned out the, the peel motor. So here's a printer that's less than seven hours old and it's now having to get warranty replaced. This also meant that we lost an extra week of print time. So instead of having two weeks to print, we ended up having two days by the time we were done. So, um, you want to look for these things called embolisms and try to have drainage adequate to prevent them. You want to find unsupported minimas and prevent them, okay? <clears throat> now, uh, I included something here about digital materials with Stratasys because it's something that doesn't get talked about much. Stratasys has a really powerful concept in some of its really expensive printers where it can have almost like an inkjet printer, different types of materials, and they can be proportionally added together to, to make so you can have fractional materials. Well, it's not very well documented, so I wanted to talk about that here. The way that you use this is you print out your model as all the individual shells that you want, and you assign each type of digital material to each shell. So if you want something to go from fully rigid, no soft, to soft, or to go like 90-10, 80-20, 70-30, what you would do is divide up your model into a bunch of shells, keep those shells all in the same STL, but then when you're laying them out on the stage, you would go into that software and change the material properties of each one. Now, because of the UV curing process, that UV curing process will automatically cause the separate shells to become glued together, and that's how you get digital materials. They're all glued together and sandwiched together at the point of the print. Okay. A uh, couple last little concepts here. One is about making a toolkit. Um, there's a lot of different materials in here. Some of them get used for, if you've ever done model making, hobby making, gunpla. Um, and they all, this is my kit from a few years ago. I now have three versions of this kit. Um, one in the Midwest, two on the West Coast. So anywhere I go, I pretty much have one that I can travel with. Um, there's a lot here and things come in and out from time to time. Uh, pin vices are little tiny drill, hand drill bits. I use those a lot of times for re-pinning new holes or especially when I'm trying to do pinning like for gluing objects together with little wire pins in between. Tweezers for small parts, hand saws for cutting and carving open, exacto knives, hobby files of various sizes. I even have a jeweler's file in there that's designed for uh, really fine polishing. Um, I also have one in there that's designed for more like etched surfaces, so it's made, it's got a diamond edge to it. Um, various ceramic sculpting tools, hobby cutters, what we call cross cutters, um, pinning wire, and then you may find that yours evolves as, as you're working, okay? Um, I want to talk about two last things. Um, these are very exclusive to the Form Labs brand and the the... the uh, their ecosystem. One is draft resin, and I want to talk a little bit more about what that stereolithography is doing. These are things that came out uh, around 2019. Okay, draft resin. At first I was skeptical, but draft resin is a game changer. The reason it's a game changer is it feels kind of like FDM when you print it. It's got the striations kind of like FDM. But the reason why it's so powerful is because it does 0.3 millimeters thicknesses. Normally, Form Lab starts at like a 0.1 millimeter thickness. And I didn't like it originally because I was like, I don't want thick models, I want pretty models. But the reason why I love it and why I've started to swear by it when I'm working with clients is because of how fast it is. To give you an example, for this exact stage you see here, okay, 
With a traditional gray resin, it was taking 12 and a half hours to print one stage of four parts. So if I have a client, I have to tell them, well, by tomorrow midday, I'll be able to get this to you and then we can get a look. But with draft resin, I could get that same print within three hours, two hours, 59 minutes. That means I could get them an answer from them by lunch. And then if they have any changes, I could go make those changes and have them another round of changes by end of day, which means by the time we get to lunch the next day, when the one print is done, I could have gone through three or four revisions to my model and gotten them closer to locking off and, and signing off on the piece. That's incredible from a prototyping standpoint. So draft resin is about a quarter of the time and <clears throat> let's see what it looks like. Now you can see the striations on the blue. The blue is the draft resin. The gray is that standard V4. These are both of those prints that came off of those stages. Okay. Notice that the, the little supports are very, very thick on draft resin. It's kind of a crude resin. Okay. You can see the little striations of the different layers. But notice how the little tiny supports and other stuff that are on the gray, it's clean. But if I need a client to sign off on something, I got this other one done in three hours versus 12 hours. That is a game changer. And they might say, oh, well, we'd like it to be a little cleaned up, but, but I got it in their hands so soon that I got an answer back. Now I'll say, oh, good. Now, if, if once you've signed off, we'll send it to print and we'll have it to you by tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> and there you can see a little bit more of a close-up. You can see the striation lines on it. But given the speed and the time, and especially if you're dealing with something that's very large, let's say you're dealing with something large that doesn't really need that detail. Well, that means I can work large quick. It no longer has to be 15-hour renders for something. I can now work and do an entire stage, a large-scale stage, in a few hours, especially if I'm going to be doing something like doing a post-treatment over it, or if I'm using this as part of a larger diorama or something where I might even be priming over it, adding some extra kind of cementing and other stuff or gesso or whatever so that it's got thickness and tooth. Well, I might be covering over all the details anyway, in which case it gives me something look, feel about like FTM, but in a quarter of the time. Okay. Now LFS, and I, I'm showing you a piece that I, I printed intentionally to break. This was printed on a form two with the version four gray resin, but you can see those little broken points. This was me showing off that this model would really take advantage of, of, uh, LFS. And the reason I did this is so, okay, that's a very, very thin edge that gets down to a fraction of a millimeter thick. Well, it gets so thin that it breaks. Well, because LFS has less peel strength or less peel torque, it doesn't have as much torque every time it peels. So they can make the support smaller, which means they're more fragile. Um, and they're not as obstructive to the model, but it also mitigated the areas where it was tearing. So LFS is, is another one of these game changers. If you're lucky enough to work or print on a Form 3 or on a Form 3L, one of the Form 3 series, then you are taking advantage of a printer, the third generation Formlabs printer that uses LFS, and it is incredibly powerful. Uh, as a person who has multiple Form 2s, I'm envious of those of you that have Form 3s. Okay, last slide and then we will be out of here is there's a couple of magic numbers that I want to talk about. One is 80% and one is 50%, okay? 80% is a magic number because if you scale your model by 80%, it's almost the same size as normal, which can be really good for a client, but it takes up half the material, 50% of the material, okay? Um, that means it's really good as kind of a last prototyping test. Run it at 80%. It's half the material, get confirmation from your client, then go to full size, okay? At the same time, um, if you multiply by 50%, it makes your, your size of your model one eighth, okay? The only problem with the one eighth though is oftentimes if you go to 50%, you also need to account for the fact that you're gonna be half size by actually thickening up some of your sidewalls. Because let's say you have two or three millimeter sidewalls, when you go to 50%, they're now gonna be 1.5 millimeter sidewalls or 1.0 millimeter sidewalls. It means that plastic will be very soft, okay? So usually when I go to 50%, it means I have to account for that by kind of 
reducing and simplifying my model and thicking up, you know, kind of pre-thickening its sidewalls, okay? But 80% usually doesn't give me that problem at all. That's why I say 80 and 50 are my two magic numbers when I'm doing a lot of 3D printing. Uh, hope that helps you. Okay, this is uh, Troubleshooting Cleanup for 3D Printing. I hope you've enjoyed it. Again, there's the QR code if you're interested in the slides. Um, my email is there. If you have any comments or questions, love to hear from you guys. Uh, have a safe uh, 2020. Enjoy the rest of your Seagraph. I look forward to hearing from you guys and uh, have a great day. I've enjoyed it. Cheers.